If you have a great story, you have a book. If you can light that story, you have a play. If you can lance that story, you have a feature. Something really cool happened recently. I got to go chat with Ari about movies, cameras, lenses, pretty much everything to do with filmmaking. And I'm so excited to share that chat with you. Now you guys know I'm not a huge gearhead. Every camera is fantastic right now, but there's no doubt that Ari makes the best cameras in the world. And so I feel so honored and lucky to have had this experience. And I'm so grateful to Ari and Francois and the team over there for letting us have this conversation. And I think there's a lot in here for you to take away. Now this is a fairly unfiltered chat that kind of goes all over the place. So maybe treat this kind of like a podcast. I hope you enjoy it, but more than anything, I really hope you learn something. But I'm gonna stop rambling because there's already a lot of rambling in this video. Here is my conversation with the fine folks at Ari at the Creative Studio here in Toronto. All right, we are chilling at Ari's Creative Space. I've got Francois here. Francois. Tell me a little bit about where we are right now. We are at the Creative Space in Toronto, Canada. Creative Space are intended for director of photography, gaffer, to come in, test lights, lenses, cameras, things like that. And it's a safe environment because what we found in the past is that there are lots of people in the creative aspect and the technical management are basically lacking the time on set to do these tests. There's lots of time where they're gonna say, what if I had an extra hour or two hours? So I cannot do it on this project, but I would really like to try this feature, this slow motion, maybe these FSND filters, things like that. So this is the place to do that outside of your shooting environment. And I feel like it speaks a lot to how you guys are more than just a camera company or a lighting company. I think one of the best things I learned from you guys is that you're all about the production process entirely. And you look at it more creatively and almost like philosophically, than you do the technical side of it. Absolutely. How important do you think it is to not just look at gear technically and think about it more psychologically even? It starts with a story. And in general, if you have a strong story, you tend to see the narrative following and the equipment following. What I mean by that is I tend to follow a couple of storyteller and not necessarily director of photography. If I find the person that has the right script that is able to deliver, in general, people are going to be attracted to the project and they will follow up with a great gaffer, a great director of photography, great director and so on. And that is going to end up being a beautiful piece. But it starts with the story. So the first question we ask is, what is your story? What are you trying to accomplish? Everything is based on how do you go from that story to how do you craft that image on set. Some of the best established director of photography, many of them said the same thing. They said, I started as a painter. And at one point, I felt that I wasn't good enough at my skill to tell my story. So I moved to photography because it would bring me to the next level to tell my story. And at one point, I felt that still pictures were not enough to tell my story. I needed the pictures to move. So it was always about, I had a story to tell, I'm an artist, and I use a different tool to get to that point. If somebody starts with, well, I need that many pixels, I'm gonna have that resolution, I'm gonna shoot wide open, I have to ask, what are you shooting? And a lot of the time, I don't necessarily get the answer. That tells me that they're probably going the wrong direction right from the start. That brings us to this camera right behind you. Yes which is the new 35, mm -hmm. the Alexa 35. And I think what's interesting, and especially with my audience, because I know a lot of you guys are really into this full frame, large format, it's kind of a buzz right now. And for right reasons, I think a lot of great films have been shot on large Absolutely. format now. And I think the mirrorless sort of revolution has also changed our perspective yep. of large format. But you guys came out with your brand new camera, the 35. How do you find people responding now to Super 35, even though it's a little bit out of fashion, if you want to call it that? Interesting. Yeah. Out of fashion. <laughs> Again, it goes with the narrative. Yeah. I mean, there are stories that were, sh that were shot in the 1970s that are still holding really well Absolutely. today. So I think the narrative is timeless. When we came up with the 35, it was in parallel with the mini LF and yeah. the full size LF. There is a need for Super 35 in some narrative and there's some need for large format in others. And in some cases we need super large format with like the Alexa 65. But these two cameras are really intended for different approach. Large format has a character, Super 35 is a character, but there's also a business aspect behind it. If you're a rental house, when we came up with a large format camera, the mini LF and the full size LF, it meant that you had to invest into full frame or large format glass. Mm -hmm. You might not have it. While you gathered glass for the last 30, 40 years, it's on the shelf, it's paid for, it's generating pure revenue. So it's difficult if a DP comes to see you and says, I want to go large format. It's an extra investment and what you have is not paying. 
But if you have a 35, you can reuse all that glass. And you add that to those who are saying, I want to shoot film stock. I want to go back to celluloid. Yeah. In the Alexa 35, we added textures. Yeah. So it means we have more dynamic range in film. We have the same color science as film. And we're adding textures that are to emulate film. So that not only can you use that vintage glass, but you can also now use vintage look. You can use vintage texture. You can do whatever you want from a creative perspective. You know what kind of sucks sometimes? Trying to find music for your project. You know what doesn't suck though? Music bed. Don't get me wrong, I love making videos, but I do not like getting bogged down by process. And music bed makes it easier than ever to find high quality curated tracks for your films, commercials, or YouTube videos. My essay on the creator had over four different tracks from music bed. And the best part is I never compromised on my vision out of frustration just trying to find good music. I found multiple good tracks for that video. I got exactly what I was looking for and Musicbed makes all of my videos better. But don't just take my word for it. Hear the difference for yourself and sign up for a free account. If you use the code I'm Patrick 23 at checkout, you're going to receive one month free when you purchase an annual subscription. I really appreciate you checking out Musicbed as it helps me make more videos like this for you. And thank you again to Musicbed for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to the chat. I recently watched her, Spike Jones's yes. Hoite Ven Hoitima, Alexa classic. Yes. What what is the look? You know what I mean? That everyone's sort of after? Because I was rewatching that movie and there's that's Super 35, yes. right? But there's something about that image that it, to me it reminded me that Hoite is the reason why that looks so good. And I don't want to discredit the camera because it's a big part of it. I know you guys have a color science and it's all sort yep. of baked in. But do you think he goes in and says, This is the look that I want, and it doesn't really matter what camera I use as long as it serves the story that I'm telling? I think it's a mix of both. Yeah. What I mean by that is an Alexa is easy to use. Yeah. It's almost like cheating because you just turn it on, you pull focus, you adjust your white balance, and you're pretty much ready to go. And you're looking at a picture thinking, wow, I didn't have to fix anything. Yeah. It means that you have more time to craft the shot. And I think that's the important part. But the Classic was interesting because if we go back in time in 2010, when the Alexa Classic came out, there wasn't a lot of digital camera out there that looked like film. Yeah. There actually wasn't any. Yeah. There were some cameras that did 24 frames per second, but they were all video style ENG, EFP, electronic news gathering, electronic field production. They were really contrasty, really low dynamic range. Yeah. They were intended to do something completely different, but because they did 24 frames per second, they ended up on features. People were like, they were kind of MacGyvering those cameras yes. into film cameras, right? Like they were. They were using two lenses and mirrors and stuff to put depth of field yes. adapters. And like it was not, there was a lot of barriers between getting a slightly Absolutely. okay image. But I think one thing that was successful in that transition is for one thing, the camera was easy to use and we provide lots of training. So many director of photography or cinematographer went from film stock, celluloid, they had not moved to digital camera because they didn't like that look, they didn't like that MacGyvering totally. approach. <laughs> but basically they saw it as the first camera that looks like film yeah. and operates like a film camera. I think they approached it as if it was shooting celluloid. You need to make sure you have the shot before you start rolling. They came with an expertise, a skill set, and they said it is a new tool. I'm going to learn how to use the tool, but I want it to perform the same way film did. This is when you go from, I'm delivering content to I'm actually creating something beautiful. And I think that in the case of her, we have a mix of all of that. Yeah. You have a mix of a cinematographer that is extremely knowledgeable, extremely skillful, an artist, and you have a really powerful tool that brings him much closer to what he wants to achieve, so he has time to craft his vision. I feel like there was a transition period between celluloid and digital, where a lot of DPs who came from the film world really treated the camera as a film camera still. It was like, it was like a swap out, right? And so all the lighting principles, you know, colors in the frame, production design, locations, yes. wardrobe, was so important. We're starting to look at camera first a little too much. Yes. I don't know if you've noticed that, and I think Absolutely. it has something to do, and I keep looking at this because Lee's on an FX30 right now. And you know, recently we had that whole thing with like Gareth Edwards and, and Greg Fraser shooting the creator on an FX3, and cool, big buzz, yep. amazing. That's really fun that you can get a consumer, you know, $5,000 yes. camera and do that. But what people didn't realize in that, and we did a whole, I did a whole video about this, is that there's still the frame inside that that's being captured by that sensor that, you know, if you can't make that look good, you're never gonna make this camera look good either. So I think the takeaway, what I'm trying to tell the audience is like, don't look at this and be like, I need that to make a great movie. But what this does is completely remove all the barriers to focus on that other stuff. The unique things about Ari is in addition to being storyteller, we're a family owned company. And that is really important. 
we were created by Storyteller for Storyteller and owned by a family company, a company that is now more than 107 years in that industry. So they see everybody who buys a camera as a friend, as a collaborator, as a partner that tells us what we need to do in the camera. The classic lasted many years and continues to this day and there are many people renting classic today because they said that's the camera I learned on, that's the camera I'm working on, I have a perfect picture quality, why would I change? And they're right. It is a perfect picture quality to the point where we reuse that sensor on an entire generation of the camera for 13 years. The approach to these numbers, the high number of Ks, faster speed and things like that, is something that is trying to target a really defined demographic. If you have somebody that says, I sell paintbrush, but I'm not a painter, of course they're going to go on the number of strands that are in that paintbrush, they're going to go on the number of Ks, and then you get into an environment where you're either trying to appeal to a demographic that is interested in numbers and specification above and beyond, and a lot of the time it's misleading. It gives the impression that if you have the product, it will make you a cinematographer. There's a company uh, a couple of years ago, I'm not going to name the company, but they were printing a certificate and if you bought that camera, they would say you're a professional because you bought that camera. <laughs> and I was trying to wrap my head around it. So buying this camera makes you a professional, even if you've never turned it on. There are many people coming to see us saying, when is going to be your next camera? Yeah. I'm thinking, well, what we just came up with a new camera. But our engineer don't think like traditional engineer. They don't see it as, I need that many pixels. They're going to say, I need a better picture. What we're doing is we're trying to think like the writer. We're trying to think like the director, like the producer. We're trying to think about the next step. What are you trying to accomplish? You don't really have like a consumer line, you know? No. And I think that's interesting for the audience because some people will look at this and go, I'm never going to be able to afford that. I love mathematics, but I'm not good at yeah, it. Yeah, so same. I cheat a little bit. So I yeah. take easy numbers. It's $6 million per episode. Okay. And they shoot in six days. So I calculate as a million a day. And if you're shooting about 10 hours a day, and I know for those who are in a corporate industry, you're probably getting eight hours is enough. If you're on set, you know that you're working 12, 14, 16 hours a day. But to make it easier to calculate, because I'm not good at math, we're going to go with 10 hours. That ends up being $100,000 an hour. And if you divide it down, it's going to go to about $25 a second. Granted, some of it is the salary of your actors, some of it is above the line, everybody above the line, you're going to have permits and things like that, but your overall cost is going to be in that magnitude. If you're walking in the dark on a set and you look at an Alexa, you're going to see that the power on button is always lighted, even if the camera's off. And there's a reason we do that. It's because you're walking on a set that is 60,000 square feet, a huge set, it's in the dark, and you have four people waiting at the video village with four monitors on, ready to go, and they're not going to get a picture and they're not going to get light in their area until you press that button. So we don't want to have people waiting for non-productive things like finding where the camera is, how to turn it on. When we go to the eyepiece, we give you a heated eyepiece because you cannot make good decision on a cold eyepiece at minus 40 degrees Celsius. You won't. <laughs> a viewfinder is what you're putting your eye on 60 hours a week, 40, 50, 60 hours a week. You are going to age, you're going to need a lot of diopter range, so we give you the diopter range. We make it warm when it's cold. We build something that has a high output OLED on it so that you can see HDR, you can see all the details that the camera can capture, so you don't have to walk back and forth to the monitor to say, did we get it or we didn't. All these things, they're not built on numbers, they're built on what are you trying to accomplish. If you walk from point A to point B, you lost time at $25 a second. There's nothing better than when you're on set of a production, it's the last day, and they're saying we're done, and I cannot wait to see the finished result. This one was special. This one meant something to me, and we like to be part of that. And we know that little things like numbers, they don't make you part of it. Do you feel like this 35 sort of represents the current state of the company and refinement of an already fantastic, damn near perfect camera that was already existed? Now it's about accoutrement and little things here and there and creature comforts. Because I know, like, I remember reading that like Chivo had an early model of this that he was playing with and, and you know testing and I'm sure he's giving you guys feedbacks. Like these are real DPs that make Oscar Academy yes. Award winning work out there. Are they they're in the field and saying, you know what, it'd be really great if this thing had internal NDs. Almost everything we do is based on customers' feedback. Yeah. They're telling us what they want. And they're not just saying, I want a button there, they're saying I want a button there because A, B, C, D. And we listen to it, we're thinking, it makes so much sense. Let's just make it happen. Often, we leave a big portion of the camera FPG infrastructure empty 
so that we can add to the camera. Because again, we're not coming up with a camera every three months. Yeah. That's not our business model. So we know that we're going to come up with features that were requested by the industry. It's really important. I thought it was interesting because when the 35 came out, everybody was talking about dynamic range, dynamic range. It was a number, number. Oh, everyone's looking at their camera like, I can't make my movie if my highlights are clipped. <laughs> yeah. Tell me why you need dynamic range. Because yes, yeah. we have more dynamic range than everybody else. But tell me how you're going to use it. If they ask numbers, I'm going to say, you don't need numbers. I'm going to show you what you're doing with the camera. Yeah. And I basically turn off every light and I turn on two candles and I do two point lighting in the dark and they have no noise in the picture. And then I open the garage door of our studio and I point that same camera without touching anything outside and they see me outside in the sun. I wanna talk a little bit about like, not demystifying, but talking about LF again, like talking about large format and 35s. So the LF seems to open up faces for people, right? Yes. And it, 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 we're framing differently yes. when we shoot on large format. Are you feeling com people coming in with like references now of like, this is the look that I'm kind of looking for and you, you kind of match what their, what their taste is, right? The answer is no. Yeah. We don't have reference like that. And there's a reason. If you are a starting cinematographer, you're probably looking at a look to emulate. Yeah. And then I would hear that. But most of the people who come here, they're basically coming here saying, I have my own look. I don't need to emulate somebody's look. Yeah. What you want is a storyteller. You want a storyteller that's going to be able to say, nobody thought about it. And there are some people coming here and they're going to say something. And at first I have to wrap my head around it. Why would you want to do that? And then they do it in front of me and I'm looking at it thinking like, this is beautiful. I would have never thought of it. So I think in your career, you get through many phases. And at first you're just going to try to get a picture and then eventually you're going to try to do something nicer. And then eventually you're going to try to emulate somebody's work. And you're going to get to a point where you're going to say, I'm tired of emulating somebody's work. I want to do my own thing. I think that's what's interesting about TV right now is because you know, a look comes into fashion and then what separates the great DPs from the, you know, the working person's DP, you can call it that, right? Where they're just gonna show up, looks good, but it's not really saying anything, it doesn't yes. have a flavor to it, is that sort of just, I'm gonna do my own thing, right? I'm gonna commit yes. to a look. Greg Fraser, he commits to a yes. look. Roger Deakins, he commits to a look. It's yes. not an emulation of anything else. Yep. It's uniquely them. Who are some of your favorite working cinematographers right now, aside from any of the people we talked about? Because I feel like it's- Roger Deakins, Roger, Roger yeah, Deakins, absolutely. Roger Deakins. Actually, I have something for uh, you. Here's Fargo oh. on VHS. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to have to explain to, to my daughters what yeah, is a yeah. VHS. A very underrated Roger Deakins production, yes. too. It's another one where, like, the compositions in this movie, any, yes. actually, everything he's done with the Coen brothers, yes. fantastic. When you're talking about DPs, again, I tend to follow stories. Yeah. So I follow director and writers. I follow David E. Kelly, what he did on Picket Fences. The stories were incredible. J.J. Abrams in Alias, Felicity, things like that. All of these director, these writers, M. Night Shyamalan with yeah. The Village and Wide Awake, one of his first movie, fantastic movie. Because the story is so strong, I think it would be impossible not to find a good DP totally. because they're going to read it and say, I want to be part of that. Um, I'm going to leave you with uh, what have you been watching lately? What, what kind of movies have you been watching or shows? And no Hallmark, because I know you like the Hallmark movies. I do no watch yeah. a lot of yeah. Hallmark yeah. movie. Yeah. The amount of content that is available, in the hesitation, you tend to go back to something you know. So I'm often going to look at a, a, a trailer and I'm going to say, that looks good, yeah. but I'm taking a chance. While this one, I watched it and I really liked it. I'm willing to watch it again. And I have two younger kids, so we're trying yeah. to watch things together. Totally. Uh, but there are lots of content out there that I'm watching. I'm saying, I want to see that. Yeah. I'm waiting for Dune 2. I don't remember the last, we're binge watching everything now, yeah, yeah. To always. So the idea I would go to a movie theater and it would finish. I would think like, I have to wait how long for the follow-up? <laughs> year, two years now, yeah. I, I didn't think it was going to be two years at that yeah, time. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> thought it was going to be two years, but it's like, we're not wired for that anymore. No, so that not. was really, really difficult. There's a movie I watched recently, and this is going to have to be in the video, House of Sand and Fog. And if you haven't seen it. I've not seen it. <sighs> House of Sand and Fog is fantastic. Yeah. It's up there for me with like a Fargo type. I think wow. it actually might be one of my favorite Deacon shots movies and nobody talks about it. But this one, like House of Sand and Fog, fantastic movie. Please, please check it out. And if this ends up in the video, make sure you watch House yes. of Sand and Fog. Yeah, dude, I always, I always love talking to them. It's always a pleasure. It's always Hopefully a pleasure. we'll hang out again soon. Yes.